last week I asked the question about about whether the Bible, you think that the Bible is any less inspired, or whether you think that maybe the Bible is just taking mythical stories and twisting them, or whether you think that, you know, whatever, maybe you're just trying to, trying to religiousize a pagan thing, like maybe people would do, like, you know, when Lord of the Rings come out, and then they come out with a book called Finding God and Lord of the Rings. When Pirates of the Caribbean comes out, and they come out with a book called Finding God and the Pirates of the Caribbean. And when Harry Potter comes out, and they come out with a book called but is it something like that, or is it is something that was still inspired by God, and if so, how do you how do you reconcile the fact that the Bible is was written after these things? Logos were given long before Moses was given the law. Sargon the Great was in the 2300s, and Moses was in the 1400s. Obviously, a reference to Sargon the Great in replacing Moses in the basket. The instructions of a man were in 1200, and then um, the Book of Proverbs was in 900 to the 700s. Um, so obviously, you have the Bible coming after after these things, so that just begs the question. So, I don't, I don't think it really uh, affects my, my belief in the Bible either way. I don't think it lessens the Bible. I think maybe God used it, used those things, so that way it helps. You know, like okay, so. Um, Moses in the basket. Well, God saw an opportunity that, you know, everybody knows the story, so it kind of helped Moses' mom see what she needs to do and um, kind of gave her hope of, you know, the baby is going to be cared for, you know, by God's God said. You know. Do you think that it, do you think that it lends to the idea that the Bible is either mythical or in large part, mythical, like made-up stories, that it didn't really happen, written after the fact. Do you think it gives credit to that kind of a thought? No, I don't think so. Why not? Well, for one, God said every single word's inspired by God, not just some things that aren't... But pause. Provable. That's actually called the circular argument. In other words, this has to be true because it says it has to be true, so it has to be true. Well, you're right, and I, I, would, I would agree that I also think that the Bible is God's word. But when we're dealing with non-Christians, we, we really can't give circular arguments, you know what I mean? Like, the earth has to be a million years old, because Darwin says it has to be a million years old, so it has to be a million years old. Well, right, but what about, like, see what I mean? Yeah. That kind of makes sense? Yeah, I, I, um, I think, I just keep thinking of, like, you know, how... Easter and Christmas. Is Easter and Christmas really on the day of? Well, no, they're on pagan holidays because Christians saw it as an opportunity to use those. Mm. So, mm. God saw this story, and everybody knows the story, so he used it to be able to make it glorify him instead of hmm. those people. Hmm. Anybody else have anything to say? <laughs> Gold started crazy. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, I keep thinking about that, if you guys have something else you want to add, go ahead and say it, but how do you think um, it would affect us if the Bible was, the, the stories of the Bible were just myth mythical, didn't really happen? I think it would make God less powerful in our eyes. Mm -hmm. mm. In our eyes, okay. Yeah. There's, I got you. wouldn't have any faith in, a, you know, in God and the Bible okay. was mythical. Well, how some people have sought to reconcile these things is... They've actually taught a few different things. The first thing is actually called... Now, don't laugh, Chuck. It's actually called the world that was. And the, don't laugh. And the idea is that God created a world previous to our world, or maybe it was the same world, we don't really know, and things happened on that world, but then that's not really recorded. And then from that, God either made or remade the present world. 
depending on whether it was destroyed, the different philosophies and different things like that. Or maybe there's just a completely different world. It, you know, a lot of different theories on that. Um, and so that's why the Earth is, is millions and millions of years old, but why the, why the Bible only records, you know, a couple thousand years. So, I mean, stuff like that. Um, and what people have done is they, they've sought to kind of reconcile the two. Another thing that they did was they they try and say, okay, the Bible is is a history book and it directly, completely records every year of the world. And so we can date how old the earth is by what the Bible says. And there's other people who have tried to reconcile what the Bible says by, it's called the, the um, oh, I forget what it's called. Ah. Oh. It's going to come to me eventually. But basically the idea is um, proving or disproving things in the Bible based off of your reason. Why is there evil in the world? Well, coming up with an answer based off of your reasoning, well, that's because of this, which is what I do. I gave, I gave my reason as to why, why there's evil in the world based off of reason, not based off something the Bible directly said. See what I mean? Then there's other people who say that the Bible... That's not relevant to something. What? Relativism? Uh, no, relativism is where um, I find the truth and I make the truth, you see what I mean, as it applies to me. Um, what I'm talking about is where you, where you study the Bible and it doesn't answer a question. Like, for instance, how can God, how come it says that God became angry if he never changes? How come it says um, that God remembered if he, if he can't ever forget? So these kinds of things. And so instead of seeking an answer from the Bible or from that kind of context, it's where you brainstorm in your head and you come up with something that sounds right. It just makes sense. See what I mean? And it's not necessarily that it's based off of a relative truth theory so much as it is filling in the blanks where the Bible didn't fill them in. Does that make sense? You see this happen when people try to reconcile evolution with the Bible's creation account, which is actually what I try to do again. <laughs> uh, I, 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 this is my biggest flaw in, 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 in biblical studies, is the use of intellectualism, sometimes even to the detriment of historical records or um, what the Bible says itself. Um, and I'm not advocating, and I'm just pointing out something that I do, So, just so you guys know. Um, where was I going with that? But, yeah, so what do you guys think about that? Does that change your argument on this at all, or not really? Just trying to get, just trying to get those those wheels turning. Just be thinking. I think if I wasn't so grounded in my faith, uh, like if I was a new Christian or I wasn't really in. Did you say a noob? A new Christian. Oh, a new <laughs> W. Got it. Or if I wasn't really involved um, in reading the Bible and praying and everything, I think I'd be shaken by this question. Hmm. Okay. Well, I would like to take this opportunity before we move on to point out a book. It's right there by Zach, if you'd like to take a look at it. It's called The Bible Among Myths. It is by far one of the, the best books I've ever read on anything religious. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, Definitely worth the weed, worth the read, not the weed, the read. <laughs> um, but it, it definitely, I would check it out. It's by uh, his name is, I believe, it's John Oswald. I'm not positive on that name though, but his last name is Oswald. It is. Okay. Um, really, I, I I enjoyed the book, um, and and the basic idea of it is like the title says. How do you reconcile the fact? is the Bible's trueness and trustworthiness with the ancient myths, you know? So that kind of it really really does with that question. I highly recommend it. But anyways, well, go ahead. One thing that um, we studied a little bit in the youth group um, about, like, the Bible compared to other ancient literature, mm -hmm. and it uh, said that we have more original documentation of the Bible than anything else in That's true. ancient literature. Like, I think it's um, the Odyssey or the Iliad, I don't remember which one. We have like three manuscripts, and none of them are complete manuscripts. 
we've it's been able, it's the Odyssey, Odyssey. and we've been able to to piece it together, and, and nobody really questions the historicity of it. Whereas the New Testament, for instance, we have it's like fifty four over fifty four hundred manuscripts of just the New Testament. Yeah. Now, obviously, none of those are the originals. Obviously, we don't have the originals of any of those kind of things. Right. Um, but uh, but still, that's a lot to go off of, and we don't just have it in like the Septuagint, which is in Greek, or the Targums, or this or that or the other thing. We have all of these different things that we can compile it with, and we can compare them with each other to kind of get a fuller understanding. And there are very few places in the Bible that we're not sure of. One of them is John chapter eight, or yeah. I think it's John chapter 8, where, where the woman's caught in adultery and he says about casting the first stone. That chapter may not have existed in the original manuscript. May not have. Uh, Mark has three different endi endings in your Bible. We usually have two of them in the text and then one of them in, in the little column Footnotes. at the bottom. Yeah. Footnotes, that's what it's called. Um, whereas the truth is that oh, those other two uh, endings were probably not the original ending. The original ending probably was like this. And they all ran away scared. That was probably the original ending. But, with that being said, you know, they include those other things just in case. Because the oh, yeah. oldest manuscripts didn't have it. But then we had more, or later documents, like, you know, that, that, that were, that were a, a more complete manuscript that did have it. So, you're, you're faced with these questions, and, and, and translations really aren't that, that precise. No matter how word-for-word word your Bible is, it will never be able to get completely word-for-word word with the text. No. That's just something that people need to understand. And so, a lot of times when people, when people try and point out errors in the Bible, it's not actually an error in the Bible so much as it is an error in the translation, yeah. or in your understanding of the Old Testament versus the New Testament, or, you see what I mean, it, it, I have yet to find something in the Bible that was actually an error, so I, I don't know, but I'm biased, obviously, because I'm a Christian, and, you know, that's what people say, but. anyways, so this is just my take on it, um, aside from what the book has to say, I still highly recommend for you guys to go read that book. This is, call it a, uh, an epilogue, a side note, a, <laughs> a footnote. <laughs> um, first off, you can't ignore the culture and setting of a book. This is true no matter what we're talking about. Um, if, we're, if we're talking about, for instance, Greek historians like Thucydides, where, you know, oh, well, they're Greek. So obviously, yes, absolutely, you have to take them in that culture. Greek historians are going to favor Greeks over the barbarians. Yeah. Because Greeks thought that they were the climax of society. Right. Well, the why wouldn't they? Yeah. See what I mean? Like, it, it's going to have that skew on it, absolutely. Um, you know, Greeks were real big into philosophy, so they're going to they're, they're gonna have things in theirs that, that are different. So whenever you're looking at a, at a book, you need to realize that, A, there was a setting that the book was written in. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact of the matter. And uh, Solomon, okay, for instance, the Bible talks about how he grew his empire... How he was, how he um, uh, grew in wisdom and everything. He, he it talks about his trade and how, how he really expanded things for, for the kingdom of Israel. Doesn't it just kind of make sense that he would have also studied other wisdom of yeah. other cultures? Yeah. Yeah. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? He talks on and on and on about about uh, account not accountability, but having people that you that you listen to and and you know listening for wisdom and whatnot. What? Yeah, like mentorship. Yeah, and, and why wouldn't he go? He go get wi Egypt's liter uh, wisdom literature. Why wouldn't he go and and, and see the the Mesopotamians' wisdom right. literature? Why wouldn't he do these things? Like, if you were truly a wise person, wouldn't you want to grow in wisdom however you could? Right. Get daughters from other. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. And things are always have a culture. For instance, if you ever read uh, what is it called? Uh, Tom's Cabin. Uh. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, well, you can't just read that in today's society. You have to understand the different things with slavery. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a big part of the book. Yeah. The Scarlet Letter. Um, Another example. Um, See what I mean? Things where you just you can't remove it from its culture because no. we are we are products of our culture. Whenever somebody says something, our brain does this thing where it filters whatever somebody says. Okay. Basically, this is what somebody actually said, and this is what you what you hear. You only abs absorb a part of what the person was actually thinking in in their mind. You see what I mean? Because there's this veil that's over over our minds, where we understand things according to what we understand. 
You see this happen when people have with the gifts of the Spirit. How when somebody gives a word, they'll say something according to how they understand something. Does that make sense? Like, they'll give a word, and, and, and you'll know something in the Bible that they don't. So they'll say something, and you're like, ah! But then they'll say this other part that was clearly God. And so it's like, how do you reconcile that? God told them something, and then they absorbed according to what they understand. So then they spoke out according to what they understood, and then you absorbed from them according to what you understood. So you have like a third-party situation of finding out what God... <laughs> right, exactly. That's why it's important you read this. Because how do you how do you tell what's your fault, error in understanding what's their error in understanding? Because we know the error didn't come in the word that God gave. See what I mean? So read the Bible. Anyways, um, similarities, cultural references, or allusions don't mean don't mean God didn't inspire them. It just means that God utilized what people um, would understand. Okay. For instance, if there was no such thing as poetry, why would God use the Book of Psalms? People didn't have any idea of poetry, so there wouldn't be a, a book of psalms. But because there is such an idea of poetry, God can work through the book of psalms. Does that make sense? Um, why the, the the laws? Well, when we when we when when we study ancient laws of the time, we're able to understand the laws of the Bible way better. For instance, I was reading in the Law Codes of Hammurabi, and he said. That if you were to kill your slave, you had to pay a fine. That's not what Exodus says. It says if you kill your kill your slave, you die. Right. But it's just a slave. According to God, a life is a life. Right. If an animal kills a person, the animal has to be killed. End of conversation, because the person is more important than the an animal. Right. But then it says this. If the animal has been known to be violent and then kills someone, then it's your fault too. Now, I don't think you had to die for it. I think you had to pay a fine and kill the animal and then uh, pay reconciliation. Let me check that. Yeah. It's Exodus chapter probably 22. No, 20, it's 21. Uh, when an ox scores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. The owner doesn't, doesn't he, it's not really his fault. It was an accident. The animal's killed. Right. Verse 29. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, it's, if it's been known to be violent, right. and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in, and it kills a man or woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. I was wrong. The owner is also liable, liable for death. Why? Because that person's life is important. Right. And through their negligence, somebody died. They didn't have to die. Right. See what I mean? So, uh... <clears throat> God gave us the law according after the law after laws were already invented so that we would understand the law. Because if we didn't understand how to understand a law, then why would Moses have, have like God, I don't know what you're trying to say here. I, I, I don't know. But see that's the beauty of it, is that God let people create their own laws so that he could then give them his law so they could see what his character is like. You understand the difference? See, now we know that God loves people. Right. Well, I didn't get that when I read the books of the law. Yeah, because you're reading it 3,000 years at, 3, years after the fact. Yeah. Laws have changed. Culture has changed. Yeah. So you're, you're getting a glint. Remember I said about the veil thing? Well, now you've got another veil on top of your normal veil <laughs> called 3,000 years of history. Yeah. You've changed. Things have changed. Uh, anyways... And that doesn't mean that God hasn't inspired it. It just means exactly what Grace has said. It means that God uses according to what we would understand. Mm -hmm. During that time. Right. So similarities, um, that doesn't prove the, the, the mythical thing of it. For instance, there are multiple different cultures who have an account of uh, the flood. Noah's flood. You know? right. Obviously, all the different, uh, the, 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 there's differences in all the different accounts. Even the Native Americans have one, guys. Yeah. Like This is literally the oldest story in the world, I think. Right. Anyways, um, but they all have the same basic idea. Um, either the gods get mad, or in one story, uh, the gods just got tired of people being so noisy. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I forget where that one's from. Uh, anyways, and so they, 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 they wipe everybody out through a flood, and one guy comes out comes out alive. So, I mean, in all the stories, the basic thing is there. Well, so in that case, we can say, well, maybe that was actually a historical story. But in the case of the instructions of Amenemep, 
we can say Solomon was out to out to learn wisdom. It makes sense that he would have things that mirrored. Instructions of Amenemet clearly say my thirty sayings. Well, in Proverbs chapter seven, uh, chapter twenty-two, uh, he clearly said around verse twenty, "Have I not written for you thirty sayings?" Obviously, a reference to to the Egyptian literature as well. Um, in the case of Sargon, Sargon the Great, that whole story with Moses. Let, well, let me just flip to it. Pharaoh, if, if Pharaoh was back in the day, they didn't send their daughters out to be married. Right. The Egyptians had this pride thing. However, they would take other people's daughters in marriage. So it makes sense that Pharaoh would have potentially married a Semitic woman or someone else from the Mes Mesopotamian plain who would have brought those stories back and then told it to their daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, and that she would have then seen the baby in the basket and thought, ah, this is something from the gods and taken the baby out of the basket. That makes sense. Because it was a 900-year-old story. Of course she would have known it. Especially if her mom had been married to her dad from that area. I mean, it just makes sense. So that doesn't say that it's mythical. That just says that it relies on the culture. And listen to me on this. If you don't understand the culture, you will not understand the thing. And you'll be a huge part of that will, will be missing. You know, you can go, th you can read the books of the law a thousand times, but if you don't know the other books, of the, uh, the other laws out there that were around when Moses received the law, you aren't going to get the references. Have you ever heard, talked to somebody? Are you okay? Yeah. Have you ever talked to somebody who um, who made references to a movie that you've never seen? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's not very funny, is it? This no. guy. This guy. <laughs> it's not very funny, is it? It's the exact same thing with the books of the law. You read it at 3,000 years later, you're not going to get the references. So, hope that that kind of cleared that up. Of course, my own ideas there. Secular sources can say good things. That is absolutely true. Just because it's a secular source doesn't mean that it doesn't have anything good to say. Um, you see, Paul does this too. Um, not Paul. Uh, Jude. Jude does it. Uh... Oh, Paul does it too, actually. You see a lot of the writers in the New Testament relying on philosophies of, of the world, on, on that kind of stuff. And why? Because that's what their culture understood. Paul goes to, what is it, the Acropolis or whatever, and he says, oh, this is the unknown God. That's the real God. Um, when he talks about... Um, <clears throat> ah, crap, dang it. I had a really good example. Well, anyways, Jude talks about um, this this Jewish writing that, that we don't even have the, the completed thing anymore. It's been lost to the ages. But he, he references this, this, this story about Moses, um, the angel of Moses or ascension of Moses or something. I forget what it's called. And why? Because he was writing to people who would have known what he was talking about. He was using an example to help them learn something. Okay, so that doesn't say myth mythical. That just says... Here's a great example. When a pastor nowadays will rely on a story to help him prove his point. Plays a clip from a movie, from a popular song, right. whatever. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. So let's get through Proverbs 23. Huh? When you sit down to eat with the ruler, observe carefully what is before you. Now, now pay attention to this because this is a section here. And the idea is that... Leaders will have ulterior motives to why they called you into their presence. It probably isn't just they just want to kick it with their homeboys. When you sit down to eat with the ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Don't eat too much. And the reason why is because you don't want to be a pig in front of this person who's invited you into their court lest he skip over you for a, a uh, what's it called, for a promotion. Uh, do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Do not toil to acquire... I'm sorry, what's up there? That's that's the first thing there. Um, so the ruler will notice if you don't... Uh, um, if you do control your appetite, the ruler will notice, and if you don't, the ruler will notice. <laughs> yeah. So uh, oftentimes people... And this is this is true now, too. Sometimes people will ask you over with ulterior motives. They won't actually want to spend time with you, necessarily. But, yeah, I'm not saying be suspicious of people. But, you know... Probably a good idea to just pay attention anyways. Um, verse 4, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. This is something repeated over and over again in the New Testament. For suddenly it sprouts wings. Excuse me. Teresa. Thank you. Uh, flying like an eagle toward heaven. 
the idea that uh, that, it, that it escapes before you even get hold of it. Verse 6, Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is, he is like one who is inwardly calculating. <laughs> he, uh, five slices of my bread. <laughs> eat, and, <laughs> eat, eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsels that you have eaten. And the idea there is that the little you've eaten will come back on you. And compliments, any compliment you wasted, any compliment you give will be wasted. Thank you so much for this. And he'll be just be thinking, yeah, you ate all my bread. <laughs> you pig. And it's not just it's not just with eating. It's with other things, too. With stingy people, just because they offer doesn't mean you should receive. Do you want, do you want me to help you move? But I actually don't have the time to... You're moving. This is a perfect example. Zach's moving. This is a perfect example. Do you want me to help you move? And then inwardly I'm thinking, please say no, please say no, please say no. Right. I'm being stingy with my time. See what I mean? And so if he takes me up on that, I'm going to res resent him for it, even though I'm the one who offered. <laughs> hey, I didn't offer. Hold on. <laughs> you got it on record, but you offered. Um, but he doesn't have a truck. So. <laughs> I don't have a truck. I can't. Uh... Okay, so the little bit you've had, even if you have a little bit, it, it, it will come back to bite you. Um, verse 9, do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. Fools don't listen to people. Verse 10, do not love an ancient land. Move. Do not move. An you can love it all you want. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the fields of the fatherless. Um, and once again, the idea of entering the field is, is to do evil. Uh, enter the field to move the landmark. There are two connected thoughts. Um, so don't move, don't move an ancient landmark, which would be stealing land. But then also, especially if it's the field of the fatherless or the widow or the, or the oppressed of the people. In, in general, the Bible says this about oppressed people: If you oppress the oppressed, yeah, I said that right. Um, God's gonna gonna take it out on you. God's gonna cut you down. You guys remember that Johnny Cash line? Anyways, um, for their redeemer is strong; he will plead their cause against you. In other words, God's going to cut you down. Verse 12, apply your heart to instruction and your ear to, uh, to words of wisdom. Not towards, wis uh, towards, not towards wisdom, <laughs> to words of knowledge. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Anyways, do not withhold the, uh, discipline from a child. <laughs> Before I go to that one, I... <laughs> oh my gosh. Because that one, it makes me laugh, so I had to make sure I didn't want to say anything else <laughs> before I go to that. Uh, Okay, no, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Verse 13, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. <laughs> if you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. Now, the first line sounds funny because... <laughs> have you ever gotten a kid in, in trouble and they act like their whole world is ending? They throw themselves yeah. on the ground. Ah! It's like, okay, yeah. you're not, you're not going to yeah. die. Yeah. And in fact, people say that all the time. You're not going to die. <laughs> But what he's saying here is that disciplining your child won't lead to their death, rather it will lead to their life. So you notice the same part. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. And the idea here isn't to beat. That's not what he's what he's talking about at all. In fact, lamb. Discipline won't kill or bring life, but not abuse. We're not talking about abusive situations. Um, a rod is, is what they used in instructions. You know, like, uh, think of uh, the, the Catholic teachers. They had the... Uh, the rulers. rulers. yes. And they would smack their fingers. Yeah. We're, we're talking about something maybe a little bit less than that. So, I mean, <laughs> we're not talking about, like, just... Wah, da, da, <laughs> leaving whelps on a child. We're not talking about that at all. Um, but you might break their spirit. Yeah. See, this, this is me not, uh, not responding. <laughs> On that note, I do think that, the, that this is important. You said that it is a joke, but it reminded me of something that's serious. Sometimes when when we, as not just as parents, but also as leaders, we try to break somebody's spirit because they're doing something wrong rather than just refocus their attention. I'm not just talking about parenting. I'm talking about all things in life. We see somebody whose attitude rips us wrong, and so we try to break their spirit. You know what I mean? They just got a rebellious spirit. Yeah, and the Lord's working in them. But in the meantime, you could focus that in a more helpful direction. You don't have to be right. You don't have to break their spirit. You don't have to get them to completely submit to your way of life and thinking. Just redirect their focus. You know what I mean? Do things instead of to break their spirit and get the victory. Don't be concerned about getting a victory and just try and focus their, 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 their effort towards something else. 
Just put that out there. Verse 15, My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exalt when your lips speak what is right. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. And this is important. Have you ever have you ever just seen somebody who seemed like they were getting everything, just kind of getting bitter about it? Even not even bad people, even good people, they're getting this, and that's just not fair. You know what I mean? Serena and I were talking about this, and it's actually funny um, that I remember this because Serena got a really good deal in her house. She got her house for thirty grand, and that is just a phenomenal, phenomenal deal. And when they were originally asking fifty. Yeah, and here's the thing: the house is the house is worth ninety. Just to throw it out, it's worth ninety. And she got two hundred dollar washer and dryer for free. Sorry, so I'm sorry. I said that I'm missing a zero. Two thousand dollar washer and dryer for free. Sorry, I knew that didn't sound right. And a two thousand dollar refrigerator for free. Whoa. Now, that's a good person, right? And already, I, I imagine sometimes it, it's hard for us to see something like that happen and say, why not me? Right? That's a good person. Now imagine somebody who's evil and envying their what they're getting. God is not fair, right? I wanted to give you some perspective here. Um, let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. But I'm getting screwed in this deal. Well, hold on. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. So in other words, not envying will be better. Okay. So that takes us to verse 19 here. Hear, my son, and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber and will clothe them with rags. There's a few different things here. First off, in verse 19, he says, and it sounds like it's unrelated, but it kind of is. Hear my son and be wise and direct your heart in the way. So, so we're talking about doing the right thing. Well, obviously, being gluttonous is going to be the opposite of that. So then, be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. Now, it's not really talking so much about the evils of wine. So I don't want you guys to get sidetracked. He's talking about overindulgence. He's talking about lust and gluttony and laziness. That's what he's talking about. Okay? He's talking about those attitudes. Okay. He's going to talk about alcohol here in, a minute, here in a minute, but he's not really talking about alcohol in itself here. Okay. The, the point here is about that, that heart. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. What that means for something for slumber to clothe them in rags, in other words, they'll be sleeping and, and not getting stuff done and, and, and a slave to what they're doing, and so as a result, they won't have the stuff that they need for their food, or for their clothes. So... Oh, don't want to go to that yet. Verse 22. So, laziness, gluttony. Okay, I said that. Um, verse 22. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth, and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. So, this is just the gen general good things that come from wisdom here. Um, let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. Well, how can I let my parents be rejoice? By being wise. <laughs> um, verse 26, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Okay. <laughs> you guys ever seen the uh, Sanctum Indiana Jones, The yes. Temple of Doom? I hate that movie, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Anyways, um, okay, uh, so verse 27, for a prostitute is a deep pit and an adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait like a robber and increases the traitors among mankind. Now this is about the same or third time that he said this. My son, give me your heart and let, let your eyes observe my ways. You know, listen to wisdom and then he instantly goes to adultery. This is like the second or third time he's done that. It, it, it doesn't really seem to connect, does it? Listen to wisdom because whores. So listen to wisdom. Wait, what? <laughs> you gotta watch for the whores. <laughs> you gotta watch for the whores. And, and so I want to kind of try and connect this here. 
oftentimes when we have a heart that is resistant towards authority and rebellious, we fall prey to other things that we wouldn't normally fall prey to. One of the most common things that we fall prey to is adultery, especially as men. Women, maybe not so much. I don't know. You guys have your own weaknesses. Don't judge me. <laughs> but uh, but men, especially, uh, have this. And, you know, and I guess I should reword that because I guess women are equally susceptible. Maybe women have different motives for it, but we, we're we all kind of guilty of the same thing. Women do it because they're not loved or they don't feel like they're loved or whatever. Men do it just because they're too stupid to think five seconds ahead. Uh, you know, but anyways... Uh, so, my son, give, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my, observe my ways. L look what I'm doing. I'm living I'm living by abstinence. I'm living these, these things, and it seems like maybe I'm not having as much fun as people, but just listen. A prostitute is a deep pit. Okay, you're going to get stuck down there. And not down there. I know that sounds dirty, not like that, guys. An adulteress is a narrow... But it does, it does kind of bring up the question if he meant it in, in that kind of a way, doesn't it? Because... You know, sex, you, you know, you think of that, but then what if he's using that as an example? It's a trap. Yeah. Brings up the question, and I do genuinely wonder that. We don't really have any way of proving it or disproving it because we're thousands of years too late to ask Solomon, but you know. Um, and an adulteress is a narrow well. Imagine, okay, a well you get water from, right? So you get your bucket, you put it down there, right? And then you're trying to pull it up, but you can't, you can't pull it back up. Have you ever seen a monkey reach his hand into something and, and try to pull the tan back out, but he can't because it won't let go of the banana? Yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah. I, I, I saw a video of that. It was, it was kind of funny, and that's how they trapped the, trapped the monkeys. Kind of funny because it was just like, hey, moron, let go of the banana, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> they'll just stay there. They'll just stay there. Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. And that's kind of the idea of this. It looks like, oh, there's water down there. Let's go take a plunge. And it's like, oh, I can't get, the, I can't get it back out. I'm stuck. Even if you can, you know, it knocks against the edges and all the water spills back out. You, you don't, you're not refreshed by that well. No. That's the idea of it. It's, it's, it's a trap and it's not something that's going to lead to life. Uh, so verse 29. Who has woe? Now here here we are. I'm sorry, Blam. Prostitutes and adulterers are, uh, uh, adulterers are a trap. Um, anyways. So verse 29 goes talking about, about specifically about alcohol. Okay. Now this is going to be important because later on in Proverbs he's going to say, Drink alcohol. But here he's going to say, don't drink alcohol. So pay attention to this part. When we get to the other part, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> so verse 29. Oh, I'm sorry. I did have another note for verse 28. Um, when it says there she lies in wait like a robber and it increases the tra traitors among mankind, those are two different thoughts. She lies in wait like a robber. Okay. And increases the traitors among mankind. What's that mean by increases the traitors? Our actions affect others. Um these are people who wouldn't necessarily have done that had she not made herself available. See, there are some people who have gotten caught into into adultery and lust and those kinds of things because porn exists. There, there was something there that that was posed to them that they were unable to to resist, and that's like the idea here. It's something that would not have happened if that wasn't there. There, there are people today that need counseling that they would not have needed counseling if that wouldn't have been a factor. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to say that it's somebody else's fault when we make a mistake, but I am de definitely trying to say that our actions affect people positively or negatively. Life is a giant pond and everybody's throwing, up and throwing rocks in. What, how will your um, was it ripple, how will your ripple affect others? And that's the idea. Um, who has woe? Who has sorrow? So the idea that it brings sadness. Who has strife? Alcohol and drunkenness brings brings fighting. Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? And then in verse 30, he, he answers the question. Uh, those who tarry long over wine. Those who go to try mixed wine. And so there's a few things that he's, that he's implying. First off, he's talking about people who are fascinated, for lack of a better word, with wine, with alcohol. These are people whose attention is, is set on it. But also, not just that, these are people who dwell long over it. In other words, people who don't just take a sip, these are people who take to the indulgence. Okay? So, uh, do not look at oh, verse 20, 31. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. And the idea here is that it's fermented. Okay, that's the idea of, the, of this phrase here. 
uh, do not, don't look at when it's red and when it sparkles on the cup. The idea is that it's fermented. Okay. So in other words, he's not saying about unfermented wine, you know, like grape juice, for instance, that kind of stuff. He's not saying anything about that. He's talking specifically about the fermentation. Verse 32, in the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. And the, uh, an adder is a type of snake that's in the Middle East, so just so you guys know. Uh, it's a poisonous, uh, it's kind of like a, uh, kind of like a cobra, or, yeah. Um, it... I could have gotten a picture, I just didn't think about it. In the end, it bites like... It actually, it looks kind of... It looks like a little scary. If you look at its eyes, it's like, <laughs> I, I'm not afraid of snakes, but adders just kind of... I don't know. They rub me the wrong way. Um, in the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things, and your heart utter perverse things. So here we have a few different things. First off, it's going to throw off your sense, of, your, your sense of, of understanding. Okay, but then also there's this idea that, that your heart will per will utter perverse things. You're gonna say a bunch of stupid crap. You're gonna do a bunch of stupid crap. Um, it's gonna come back to bite you. You're gonna have headaches. All these different things it's going through. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. Well, what would happen if you lie down in the midst of the sea, guys? You die. No, the the no. waves go no. up and down. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> when, when you get drunk, you have no sense of balance, you have no sense of direction. Like one who lies on the top of a mast. Well, ships go like this when you're in the water. Lie down on a mast, see how dizzy you get. <laughs> so, um, verse 35. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. The idea of drunkenness, uh, of that kind of like alcoholism. I, I, when can I wake just so I can have another drink? Right. You know, um, doing things you don't remember, gaps of, of your life missing. Um, Arrested Development Season 4 actually uh, uses this as a joke, but uh, it, it is serious. Uh, the, one of the characters, his name's Joe, gets in what's called a roofie circle, where you'll miss like chunks of your life because you keep taking taking you know the, the the pills at a certain time of day and you keep wiping out your memory so you have no memory memory of the events she'll go through spans of months or years where you just don't remember what happened anything in there now that's that's in a, in a comedy show but the same principle is true uh, in, in a lot of times in alcoholism you'll wake up and you'll be like it's three weeks later like what happened for the past three weeks um, and I've also overdosing on, on pills and medications. So uh, that brings up a very interesting point. A lot of times people say, "Well, it doesn't. The Bible doesn't say anything about I can't, you know, do pot or do drugs or whatever." And if it's what was its point in alcohol? That it would throw off your sense of knowing what you were doing. Do what? Yeah, it alters what you're doing, what you're thinking. Uh, it it, give, it makes makes you a less um, Alert. I, I don't want to say a valuable person in society, but a less present yeah. member of society. Less productive. less productive. There's a good word. And so then we had to take that and apply it to other things. When you smoke pot, does it make you more or less? Less. less. See what I mean? And some people say, well, it doesn't affect me like that. Well, okay, fine. Then it really isn't, isn't, that's not really part of the argument anymore then, is it? But most of the people that I know are people who can't get up and go get a job because there's they're find a million different excuses why they can't, and so they're sitting around smoking pot all day, so they have no drive. So how is that any less than the sluggard that Proverbs warned us about? How is that any different than the mind altering that, the, that Proverbs warned us about with alcohol? How is meth any different? How is see? I mean, if it alters your mind and makes you less productive and makes you less coherent. All, alters you in a negative sense, then that's not a good thing. I, I, I feel like this really doesn't have to be explained, and yet it does in our in our society. So, um, and you, you know what the thing that I, that makes me laugh is when people say it's natural. God gave it to us to use. Okay, let let's go down down the list there. Carbon monoxide. That that's 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 something. That's a gas that's in the air. Let's all inhale that. Let's see what happens. Uh, you know, yeah. Why not? You know. Uh, what else we got? Oh, uh, what is that? Um, lava. There's something that naturally appears inside. God wants us to jump right in there and take a bath. Well, no, because I'll burn. That's just stupid. Exact same argument. It's something that the, that the planet naturally produces that has no no 
As, uh, people use arguments according to what they think sounds good, but that's actually more of a circular argument than anything. That means that if God gave me the... If I have a desire to rape a child, that then, by my definition of what I just said, God gave that desire to me, and I then need to act on it and rape a child. It doesn't fit, does it? So why would it apply to that? See what I mean? Like, it doesn't make sense. But obviously, oftentimes when we seek to justify something in our lives, we our arguments typically will only make sense to us because we see what we want to see. Yeah. Remember the veil I was talking about? Remember I said that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, verse 20, chapter 24, verse 1. Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their hearts devise violence and their lips talk of trouble. Don't even desire to be with these people. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled. With all precious and pleasant riches, the idea that that, that that wisdom brings contentment and brings its own treasure. Um, a wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. The idea that, that wisdom will, will help you in, in life to, to be more victorious in things, not just in war, obviously, but... It'll help you work out strategies and that kind of stuff. I just can't get. I just can't get out of my alcohol. I, I just can't quit this. I just can't. You can. Don't try to do it by yourself. There's a big difference there. Wisdom is too high for a fool. Now, now get this because this is a clear contradiction of everything that we've studied so far about about fools. Wisdom is too high for a fool. Now, get this. In the gate, he does not open his mouth. Remember how everything so far talked about a fool always having his mouth open. This is the only exception in Proverbs, and this is what he's trying to say. He is out of his element and doesn't know how to respond. Let's say, let's say there's, let's say I'm an idiot, and you guys are all talking about how to correctly manage your money. I'm not going to have anything to contribute to the conversation, am I? Because I'm an idiot. I'm out of my element. It's a, see what I mean? That's what he's talking about with the fool. So it's not really contradicting the other parts of Proverbs. He's just saying that the Fool will be out of his element and won't have anything to contribute to this. Um, so, verse 8. Whoever plans to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. So then that brings up the question by a lot of people. Um, I don't remember if I was going to say this later or not. What if my culture is wicked and... The, uh, the scoffer isn't an abomination, they're actually glorified. Why even try? Oh, I remember, we are going to look at that later. So, just remember that and we'll come right back to that. Um, verse uh, 10. If you faint in the days of adversity, your strength is small. And the idea here is that anybody can say that they're strong when they're not in the battle. Anybody can say that they love their spouse when they're not being tempted to cheat. Anybody can say that they love their kids when their kids aren't being complete brats. Anybody can say that they love their kids when their kids aren't out doing drugs and selling drugs. And What happens when your child becomes a monster that you don't even recognize? See what I mean? If you're faint in the days of adversity, your strength is small. It's, it's a principle there, the, the idea of, of it'll test the character. And so that's the true test of character by actually... What does it say? It's in the pudding? Is that what they say? The proof is in the pudding. Which I think that's a gross thing to put in, in pudding. But um, Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Do what you can to help people to, to be drawn. Well, well what, what, is, what is a slaughter? What is, what is death? What are we talking about? Is it metaphorical or is it actually something? And I would say yes. It is both metaphorical and literal. If you see somebody, go, you see somebody o overdosing. Do you leave them? No. You see somebody in an abusive situation. Do you leave them? No. <laughs> see what I mean? If you see somebody go, do what you what you can to help. The, the idea here is don't be apathetic towards other people's problems. Well, I prayed for them. That's great. You should be praying for people. However, it's not sufficient enough to just pray for people. Pray for people is the starting point and the ending point. It's the most important thing you do. It's not the only thing you do. Okay, so, verse 12, if you say, behold, we did not know this, I didn't know that it was, we should have done the, done the, watched out for other people. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? 
Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it, and will, will not he re not repay man according to his work? There's a few ideas here. The first idea is that God will show things to you as you seek after him, but it's actually more complicated than that. God knows our motives and our inner thoughts, and he knows those who are actually guilty and those who are not. So if you say, oh, I didn't know, and you actually did know, if God impressed on your heart to help somebody and you just didn't, see what I mean? He, he'll know, and he will repay people according to their, to their deeds. That makes sense. Um, and this was the part I was going to mention earlier. My son eat honey for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. No, um, I'm sorry, this was not the part I was going to mention. I'm sorry. Know that wisdom is such to your soul as you find it. There will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. So, two things I want to point out. First off, it's an analogy. The honey is like wisdom. Okay. But second off, I do want to point this out. The Bible doesn't say we can't enjoy our lives. Oftentimes, as Christians, we make it out to be as if we can't have fun or enjoy our lives. You can. In fact, I just read a book called Wake from the Dead, and I've been talking about it a lot lately, but it um, doesn't have great theology in it. But I will say this. It was very encouraging and very helpful. And it talked about a lot of areas that I saw that were kind of blind spots in life. Um, and, and one of the parts that was blind spots was he talked about the way that, oh, as Christians, we kind of resign ourselves to just endure life, and we'll be happy one day in heaven. And he said, that's not what God created us for. He created us for new life now, for joy now, for a life more abundant now, not off then somewhere. Now, obviously, we'll be perfected. Things will be perfected in heaven, but that's the end road. There's still a lot of living left to do before here and there. It's like I was watching Boy Meets World, and the dad says this to, to the son, not to the main Corey, the other guy, Sean. No, Sean's a friend. Sean Hunter, that's that's a friend. The older brother. Um, Eric, yes. He says, to Eric, he says to Eric, he says, we're on this awkward stage in life where we're not kids, but we're not dead yet. When they wanted to go to the concert? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that just made me laugh. Anyways, and it, and it kind of applied to what I was thinking. Um, so, you know, obviously, um, enjoy your life. You've only got one, and it's sticking by uh, you will never be a kid again. You'll never be a young adult again. You'll never be a senior citizen again. Right. Whatever you are in life, just be happy with that. Be content with where you are and strive to be better. Okay. Verse 15. Lie not in wait as a wicked man against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not do no violence to his home. Excuse me. For the righteous fa falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. The idea of seven times here is not literal. Righteous people don't fall and get up seven times. He's saying it, seven is an idea of completion or um, repetitiveness. So the idea is if, if a righteous person falls, they'll continue to get back up. Oh, that was seven. Can't get back up. Exactly yeah. my point. Um, and the idea here is that righteousness wins. Okay. Um, there's something else I wanted to say here. Um, well, I just don't feel like I can get up again. He's not talking about emotionally str struggling. He's not talking about that. But I will say this. Keep getting up. Well, I don't feel like I can get up. Just worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. You, you, you can always try. And even if you feel like you haven't gotten back up, you can keep on trying. Um, and don't ever stop trying is really the, the end goal there. But uh, that's a side note. What I was going to get through here is, I remember earlier I said, what do you do if your whole culture is evil and, and everybody is getting away with evil and evil is glorified and it seems like I'm, I'm alone in doing what's right? Should I just go ahead and cave in? Everybody else is lying on, the, lying on their taxes. What does it matter if, if I don't give the IRS 20 more of my dollars? What does it matter? What does it matter if I, if I, uh, um, if I, if I don't take, okay, I, I took this out of the store and I forgot to pay for it. Who cares? It's, they already factored these things in. What would you say? They'll never miss it. They'll never miss it. They already factored in these things with the prices anyway. It's just let it go. What does it matter? Right, For but my bank gives me back more money than mm, I withdrew. Yeah, before. yeah. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> and the idea here is righteousness wins in the end. Yeah. Sometimes it seems like it takes it's a long time coming, but righteousness is its own reward. And here's something I have written later on: laziness is its own reward too. When you're lazy. You may think that you've got the life of pleasure, but you're always worrying about something. You get really anxious. You don't have anything you, you want. You, uh, leisure time becomes less and less enjoyable. Do you know what I mean? Laziness is its own curse. And in the same way, righteousness is its own blessing. Um, so, verse uh, 17, I guess. 
Uh, do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad. Now, this this is something funny, guys, but try not to laugh. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Let the Lord, uh, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from, from him. So make sure not to get happy when your enemies are being persecuted, or else God's going to stop beating them up, and, and then, you know... <laughs> that's not really what he's saying but it, the principle is still there this, this is actually what he's saying another sin doesn't mean God is okay with my own retaliation okay they mistreated me now you're gonna God's gonna cut you down you're gonna finally get it back because this is what God sees God stands up for the oppressed so if you're oppressing somebody who oppressed you you're the oppressor you're the oppressor, you're the oppressor. <laughs> in other words God will withdraw and then get this Oftentimes, you will get the punishment on your own head. Uh -huh. What? How do I get out of this? How do I make my enemies suffer by not wanting them to suffer? It's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle, and it's called a paradox. Because in order for God to really bring punishment on your enemies, which in, in Proverbs, your enemies are supposed to be people. Was that mine? In Proverbs, your enemies are supposed to be people. Who are wicked. So your enemies are supposed to be the same people as God's enemies. Okay. The problem is it's not just the guy that skipped the out of you at start. Right there. IRL in real life, our enemy are people who just take us off. And that really has to do anything with people being opposed to God or not. We don't even care about that. It's like, God, who cares about you here? I'm being opposed. My life is complicated. <laughs> My life is complicated. Um and this was really a problem for us as, as leaders with the whole men's center, and it seemed like the whole Old city was coming against us on crap. I mean, as leaders, it's hard for us to not see. Oh, we're being persecuted. It's like, look, we're not the main main character in the story. It's all right if we're persecuted. It's okay. You know, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing as a church? And you know, let the chips fall where they may. You know, we don't have to be, get offended because people are offended at us. You know. Um, anyways, uh, and that's kind of the idea here. If you truly love someone then you will be in a place where you don't want to see them get hurt, and it'll hurt you when they get hurt. I mean, also, as a side note, when God's disciplining somebody, butt out. Yeah. Butt out. A, they don't need you shoving your your spiritual pride down their throat all the time. <laughs> but B, um, God doesn't really need you interfering in things. I see this a lot with parents. Where parents are don't want to let their kids go, they're adults now. Let them make their own mistakes. You know, constantly try to bail them out of jail. Constantly try to stick their finger into it and everything. It just causes a huge problem. It causes problems between the parents and the kids. I mean, the kids, the, no, nothing good comes out of it most of the time. Like nine ten. Uh, Nine out of nine times, you know, ninety-nine point ninety-nine percent of the time, just nothing is going to happen with it. There, there might be that odd duck that, you know, but most of the time, no. Um, and uh, so, anyways, just butt out when God's trying to teach somebody something. Anyways, uh, verse nineteen: Fret not yourself because of evildoers, and be not envious of the wicked, for the evil man has no future. <coughs> the lamp of the wicked will be put, be put out. Don't even, don't be envious of that. They, they don't have a future. Um, verse uh, 21, My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin that will come from them both. Now, this one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. First off, God's anger is always justified. Okay, God's anger is something that when he punishes you, you know you did something wrong. But the king's not so much. When when the government uh, comes against you, it might be because you did something wrong, or it might not be because you did something wrong. The judge might just not like you. Not much you can do about that, right? Uh, so there's that, okay? But then there's, there's this too. Both of those people have the ability to really screw up your life. God, obviously, because he's God. He can take and give away however he sees fit. And the government, because they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, everywhere. So, you know, there's that. Uh, but then there's a few more things I, I want to mention here. This is very much applicable to our day and age because there's a lot of rebellious people looking for reasons to rebel. You know, Trump's not my president. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you mean you don't approve of him being president, but he is still your president. Right. 
if you're American, you use your credit card. I mean, I don't, I don't see how your, how where your math is, but I think you flunked high school there. I mean, I don't think there's two different countries in this country. I think it's just the one. Um, I'm not saying you have to like the guy. I'm just saying he's your president either way, regardless of whether you like him or not. Um, and right now we live in a time where, where, where rebellion is okay. Rebellion isn't just okay. It's actually something that's encouraged. You know, um, uh, Kathy Griffin, who did the thing with the Donald Trump's oh, head severed, and then J and Jim Carrey, who said, yeah, she should be pushing the line too far like that because that's our job as comedians because the media won't do it. A, I disagree with them because the media kind of does do that, and you, whatever. Uh, and then B, as comedians, it's your job to make people laugh, not to, not to uh, yeah. stir up more rebellion. So anyways, um, and the idea here is that when there are rebellions going on, just kind of keep your distance from that. Because when things do, when the crap does hit the fan, you don't want to be anywhere near that. Have you guys seen, ever seen RV with uh, Robin Williams? Uh -huh. It was probably taking the, the poop out of the RV and it shoots up into the air. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of rebellion, okay? You're going to be standing out there and it's going to fall on you. You get somewhere else, under the RV or somewhere else, it's, it's, it's coming down. See what I mean? The crap's going to happen. And you don't want to be caught up in the middle of that. Uh, I know that's kind of anti-American because Americans love rebellion so much. You know, hey, everything they do is where we started. Where we started is where we keep going back to. It's like we'll never move forward. Um, ever feel like the sins of the father just continue repeated in the in the children? I, I kind of feel like that now. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, so I, I think this is one that you guys need to commit to memory here. My son, fear the Lord and the King, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin that will come from both them both. At the end of the day, the government has no bearing on our mission as expanding God's kingdom. At the end of the day, they may oppose God's church, but God's church will endure. They may give us religious freedom. That's fine, too. It doesn't matter at the end of the day what the government does or does not do, because we're part of God's kingdom. Now, as long as we're part of God's kingdom, we do have to submit to the parties, but, you know, you get what I'm saying. Well, we can't base our liking them or not liking them on the favors that they show us. Right. Show us. Right. right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, at the end, I, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but in the end, I, I voted for Trump in the end. And the reason why was I would rather have a sexist, racist, loudmouth moron in office than I would a corrupt manipulator. Yeah. Because at least Trump will know when he's doing something stupid because he's, he, he can't keep his mouth shut. He'll tweet about it. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll know. Hillary Clinton should have people killed left and right, like. And you only know. Right, like, eh, I don't feel good about that. However, I don't feel good about Donald Trump either. It's just no. I felt a little bit better He's about more, uh, about him, a moron, than I did about a manipulator. More outspoken. <laughs> yeah. So verse twenty-three, and these are all, you know, and honestly, I, I question myself every day whether I should have voted for him or not. You know, ultimately, my vote wouldn't matter anyways because, I mean, the other competitors, Johnson and all that, were so far behind, it wasn't even a competition. Uh, but with that being said, for my own conscience's sake, and, you know, it actually really does matter to other people, too. For instance, the uh, African-American population, I don't know how you say that, uh, group, uh, ethnic group, ethnicity, um, okay, that, there's, let's say that the African-American ethnicity very much so doesn't like people who who voted for Donald Trump. So, yeah. there's that. <laughs> and who knows, I guess, in the end we'll find out. I was just thinking, when, when she finally did go up to congratulate Trump for that, I literally thought her head was going to crack open and the devil was going to come out. Like, you, ah! you, you've seen, you've seen the, Omega, or the... Was it the Omega, Omega code, code or was that... Um, the Omega Code. It was? Yeah. Uh, these also are sayings of the wise. So now we have a second set of sayings, okay? So we went through the, the, the introductory was like the first like nine chapters or whatever, right? And he was talking about those different 13 things. And then we talked about general proverbs, right? And then chapters 22, uh, three, no, 22 through 24 have sayings of the wise. But then here at the end of chapter 24, there's a, more sayings of the wise, a different collection. Okay. So we're looking at a compilation of at least like three 
books so far. Okay. Um, when you read through Genesis, for instance, you might notice some things that kind of sound like they don't necessarily fit. It's very likely that parts of Genesis were actually um, legal transactions or codes that were then inserted after the fact. For instance, when Mo when Abraham uh, fights with the fights uh, the kings there, and, and, and you know, it's like around chapter like 14 or something like that, um, and to free Lot. Um, there's this part in there that just doesn't really flow like the rest of it does. It, there's a good chance that it was actually part of the of the um, agreement that Abraham made with the kings after he won the victory, um, because it says there about how they how they made it how they made an agreement there. Um, anyways, uh, in which case it's interesting that the Jewish people or Israelites I should say because they weren't Jews yet at that time um, that they kept kept hold that legal document for that many years. That's kind of cool, if that theory is correct. Uh, so, partiality and judging is not good. Whoever says to the wicked... Can you have her be a little bit more quiet? It's going to pick it up on the recording. And, uh... It's not going to... Honey badger don't care. Yeah, honey badger don't care. We should dress her as a honey badger for Halloween. Um, we'll be, uh, whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right, will be cursed by peoples, abhorred by nations, but those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. If everyone is doing wrong, God will see. Well, God will still see and judge. Those who those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. Now, verse twenty six sounds a little bit funky. A little bit funky. I'm reading it right now. Yeah. You guys, you guys know what's coming. Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. Whoa! What the? Hold on. Hold there. Um, we don't really know exactly the idea of kissing the lips. However, we can compare it to other cultures and get an idea. The Persians, for instance, ki uh, a kiss on the lips was a sign of friendship. Um, in the New Testament, Paul and others talk about a, a holy kiss, greeting people with each other with a holy kiss. As far as we can see, it's like um, a sign of friendship, and it's like a, a, sign, a sign of um, peace, partly. Um... I'm trying to think of a better word, though. Um, kind of an idea of... Let's just say friendship for now, and if I think of something else, I'll come back to that. And so what he's saying here, once again, don't leave, don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. He's not talking about the kiss. <laughs> whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. Whoever, whoever gives an... That person is a true friend. Okay? Honest answer is a sign of friendship. Okay? Don't lose sight of the forest of the trees. It's, he's, he's not saying um, whoever gives an honest answer has to give somebody a kiss on the lips. That's not what he's saying. He can start lying. <laughs> he's no. saying it's like he, he's saying it, it, it's like a sign of friendship. Okay, that's what he's saying. It's like a kiss on the lips. Once again, though, this practice has gone away in our culture. So I expect for none of you all to be kissing each other on the lips. And if you do, don't let me see it. I don't want to be part of that. Um, verse twenty-seven. Prepare your work outside, get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. Now, a lot of commentator, commentators seem to think that they're only talking about marriage here. You know, you know, work, and then get a house, and then get married. Well, I don't really see that here. I see that this is a principle more, more than that. First off, it doesn't say anything about specifically about marriage. So we can't say this is about marriage. So, I mean, you can't put words in the Bible's mouth. But, well, that makes sense. Well, yes, but... In, in a book of Proverbs, you have to understand the principle, and then see that he didn't clarify the principle, so it probably has many applications. Right. So, thing, uh, think, that's supposed to say think things out, not think things out. Think things out, that's not going to do anything. Think things out, order your life, do things in the right order. Right. For instance, I need to buy a car so I can get a job. No, 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 no. You need to get a job so you can buy a car. Yeah, so that you can get to your job. There you go. Right. See what I mean? Like, there's an order here. Oh, well, I've worked hard enough. How old are you? 25. No, don't retire yet. You still got a lot of living to do before you die. Hold on there. Right. You work, and then you retire. <laughs> In the case of Joe, he worked, and then he worked, and others said, and then he retired. <laughs> Twice, so. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, that was funny. You don't have to laugh. Uh, and so the idea here is when you're building a house, you don't, you don't stand the walls and then start bringing stuff in and, and try to start doing stuff inside. No. 
you lay the foundation, then you do the walls, then you do the, then you do the, do the um, what are they called, the brain fart. Uh, they look like this. Uh, trusses. trusses, yes. Then you put the trusses on. Then you, you know, see what I mean? There's a process that you do. And it's the same thing with everything in life. You want to do things in an orderly manner, right? Yeah. When you, it, a new pastor doesn't just go to a church and instantly start kicking out everybody who's a problem solver, right? Problem maker. Problem maker, right? They go in. They start establishing themselves as a pastor. Then they start dealing with the people, not kicking them out, to get them to, to grow in Christ, right? Right? That's what we do. Uh, it's a, a new boss, you don't just go in there and start changing all the rules. A new president, you don't just go in there and undo everything Obama did. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a joke, everybody. It's a joke. Huh? We're joking here. We're all just joking. Nobody turn on me. Um, okay. So be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your uh, with your lips. So this is talking about false witness, but why would I be a false witness to my neighbor? Well, read in verse 29. Do not say I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. And the idea here is these are two different proverbs, but they're obviously connected in some way. So maybe he's saying uh, don't be a false witness to get back at your neighbor because of resentment that you harbor against them. Um, but they are still two different proverbs. So see them as two different proverbs, but then see that they do kind of answer each other. So, uh, be not a witness against your neighbor, so don't be a false witness. Do not, don't deceive oh, with your lips. This is your neighbor, this is your friend, this is your your your, 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 your countrymen, your brothers from Russia. Uh, ver and there's, then in verse 29, it can be taken by itself as well. Don't seek out vengeance on people. Uh, verse 30, mm -hmm. I passed by the field of the sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns, the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Complete disrepair. Verse 32, and this is a, a sign of laziness. A bunch of things left undone, untaken care of. They're off doing something else that, that's more important. Anytime that they have something to do, they've always got a better way to do it, but then they never seem to get it done. Uh, verse 32, then I saw and considered it, I looked and received instruction. Do you see what he just said? I paid attention to this moron over here, and I learned something from it. Have you ever heard somebody say, I, I couldn't listen up to that uh, guest speaker, they just, I, I just I, they're just wrong. There's nothing you can you could learn from them? Because this guy just learned from a moron. Just saying. Then I saw it and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. Notice how it says there, poverty will come upon you like a robber, because notice the imagery there about robbers. Robbers take your things, right? Yeah, they destroy stuff. They destroy things. Yeah. Okay, so you, a person, giving yourself over to laziness, poverty is your robber, in a sense. You see what I mean? Because... You've just, you, you're still paying for stuff, but you don't have any money to pay for it, so poverty has come upon you. It's like a robber, quite suddenly. And then, um, and want, like an armed man. Desire. Want. Has come on you like an armed man. It has come demanding that you answer it, and you have given it away. Because people who are lazy are people who do not... Grace, you remind me about the thing with the runner in Elmogordo, okay? Um, people who are lazy are not people who can say no to their desires. See what I mean? They're always desiring and they're always hungry. Okay, so the thing about the runner. Uh, we were driving on the road today getting some stuff done um, after I did the roof. Gracie and I, Gracie picked me up in, at Home Depot and we had to do some running ground. And I saw a, a woman who was clearly trying to start working out, but it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And I said to Gracie, she's never going to make it. And the reason why is because she was getting started at 10 o'clock in the morning. You think, well, what do you mean by that? Well, if you want to change your life, you have to change your lifestyle. Yeah. And in order to do that, you see those people getting up at like 6 to change your lifestyle and their health habits. See what I mean? Because if you're getting up at 10, you're already not a driven person. You're not pushing yourself. See what I mean? Who gets up at 10? People who don't care. If you're trying to change your self-image, if you're going to try to change how you've lived your entire life of unhealthiness, you're going to have to push yourself and get out of that comfort zone. Those people who you see walking at 6 o'clock, notice how they're a lot thinner? Uh -huh. They don't wear themselves out by walking when the sun's out burning them. 
Yeah. And have a heat stroke. <laughs> and have a heat, a heat stroke. stroke. And and B, they they push themselves to see what I mean? The sluggard is a sluggard not just because, oh, it just happened to me. I'm a, I'm a victim of circumstances. Uh, no, because they weren't able to say no to their desires. Nobody likes working. Yeah. But you got to do it anyways. Right. It's not something that you wake up every day and think, I get to work today. But it's something that you do because you have to. Right. What is it that they say on Futurama in the first episode, the pilot episode? You got to do what you yeah. got to do. And I have to make you do your job whether I like it or not, which I do very much. <laughs> Anyways, um, sorry, I, I watch too much Futurama. Um, but Netflix is trying to single-handedly stop me from watching it. They take off half the seasons and all the movies. And, uh, it's a bad day to be my <laughs> Anyways, and, and so the idea here is that lazy people um, can't, can't say no to, no to things. And then as a result, they give in to, that, to, the, to their desires. They become lazy. And so then, lazy people are led to poverty. Yeah. See, we look at poverty and we think, how to fix the poverty? This person's poor. How do I help them? I need to give them money. I need to give them food. That's not the problem. The problem is the, la the laziness, which was caused by their, by their inability to say no. Uh -huh. See what I mean? So you're literally helping them to repeat their own self-destructive pattern. You are helping them to destroy themselves. I'm not saying giving to the poor is wrong. I'm saying discernment is definitely needed. So, um... Any questions on that? Because we're we're done with with. Oh, I'm sorry. I have another note here. Sorry, I forgot to write. I forgot to do that. Diligence is wise. Laziness brings its own despair. Laziness brings its own despair. But diligence is wise. Now, notice it didn't say in that section anything about being diligent. It showed the effects of not being diligent. So we can assume the opposite is true, right? Remember, I ta told you about how Proverbs says that. It'll say this is wrong, and we can we we can we can assume that the reverse is right. So if it's saying this is what laziness is like, then we can assume the other opposite is right. Be diligent, right? Say no to your desires. And obviously, not I'm not saying you can't do anything that you enjoy, but you know, have limits. Right. Je eat just one Lay's chip. I know they say or Pringle. I know they say you, nobody can eat just one, but you can. Okay, put it in a bag, you then eat it from the bag, you then throw the bag away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, any questions? Any comments? Next week we'll, we'll be watching The Village. It'll be a movie night. Here's the situation with that, okay? I will make popcorn and we'll have drinks here. If you want to bring your own snacks for you or your own snacks to share, you're welcome to do either of those things. Um, I will also...